I'm delighted to welcome you to the session on um, procedural principles in international water law and dispute resolution. And um, what I want to do is provide just a little bit of context of um, how, where this issue fits, and then um, introduce both of our panelists um, that we're very fortunate to have, and then hopefully um, hear presentations that will inspire us to have an engaged discussion. I came to international water law from international and environmental law, and I know that there is sometimes perceived to be a bit of a divide between international water law and international environmental law. Um, in any case, I recently revisited this um, terrain in the context of research that I was doing on the interplay between procedure and procedural duties and the due diligence aspect of the harm prevention rule in international environmental law under customary law. And you might think that that is technical, but ultimately straightforward terrain. And certainly, my starting point was that, um, relatively speaking, the interplay and the roles of each of these aspects are settled. At least, international environmental lawyers routinely distinguish between substantive and procedural obligations. So, substantive obligations in an international environmental law context would be standards that are, must be met through stage actions or conduct. For example, the obligation to prevent significant transboundary harm would be such a substantive principle. Procedural obligations then include duties to do things like issue warnings, notifications, provide information, consult, and also um, to undertake an environmental impact assessment. Now, in teaching and thinking about international environmental law over the years, I had always proceeded from the premise that legally, the procedural obligations are both an element of the harm prevention duty and independent of it. And that conclusion seemed obvious to me because states do not owe an absolute duty to prevent transboundary environmental harm, but a duty to take diligent measures to prevent harm. So, in addition to taking appropriate regulatory or policy actions, they must undertake an assess environmental assessment, notify, warn, and so on. And so, depending on the circumstances, at least my assumption was a failure to do that can amount to a breach of or a lack of due diligence and could constitute a violation of the harm prevention duty. And at the same time, because procedural obligations um, exist independently in customary law, they can also be violated independently of the substantive duty. Well, that all seemed clear to me, or so I thought, but perhaps it isn't, at least not in the law governing shared freshwater resources. And it struck me that a set of relatively recent decisions of the International Court of Justice seem to suggest that things are much less clear than I've just set out. And the two decisions, of course, are the 2010 decision in the pulp mills case that we already um, heard about earlier today, and the 2016 decisions in the Costa Rica versus Nicaragua, Nicaragua versus Costa Rica cases. The pulp mills decision seemed to showcase the court's efforts to flesh out the due diligence standard and to clarify the contribution that procedural obligations make to environmental protection and harm prevention. But note that even there, a closer look might show that 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 clarity perhaps was more perceived than real, at least in the joint dissenting opinion that we also already heard about uh, today with uh, that Judge Sima and Judge um, al Kassani, who unfortunately is prevented from joining us here today as he had planned, where they charged that the court missed a golden opportunity to clarify the role of procedural obligations as an indicator of whether subst substantive obligations have been breached. And then, in the 2016 decision, the ICJ may have furthered the impression that there is a degree of murkiness to this interplay. The court seemed to be intent on specifying a sequence of procedural obligations, including environmental impact assessment, and that's good, of course, but also seemed to suggest that where no harm is ultimately caused, procedural obligations may have been violated, but not the substantive obligation to prevent harm. And again, here there were pointed differences of opinions um, expressed in a range of separate opinions, um, uh, not least by Judges Donahue and Dugard, and they disagreed not only with the court, but with each other. So the waters are suitably muddied, I would say, 
And I'm delighted that we have here some leading experts on our panel today to um, clarify things for us and also hopefully take us further than um, the stage setting that I've just done. And of course, also there are many of you in the audience who've been involved in one way or the other with these issues. So I think we can really expect to have a lively discussion. So what I will do is I'll introduce both of our speakers and then they will come up and turn uh, and speak to two different perspectives on, on this terrain. Uh, so first of all, Prof Professor Attila Tanzi, who's the chair of international law at the University of Bologna, and he has acted as counsel or arbitrator in a variety of interstate and investment arbitrations. He's also um, a member of the PCA, a member of the PCA specialized list of arbitrators for environment list disputes a conciliator in the Court of Conciliation and Arbitration of the OSCE, and chairman of, and I hope I'm getting this right, the Implementation Committee of the UNSC 1992 Water Convention. So he, advises, he also advises governments and international organizations on a range of international law issues and um, focuses on um, a range of areas, but one of his areas um, of long-time attention is environmental and especially shared transboundary water issues. Our second speaker, Professor Owen McIntyre, Professor and Director of Research at the School of Law at the University College of Cork, and he also focuses on environmental law with particular interest in international water law issues. He is published widely, as is Professor Tanzi, of course, um, in these areas including a book on environmental protection of international water courses under international law that was recently translated um, into Chinese. Uh, he is also um, involved in a whole range of practical capacities in the issues that um, are of interest to us here today. And among other things, in 2011, he was appointed to the global faculty of the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization Center for Water Law, Policy and Science at the University of Dundee. I could go on about both of these um, experts, but um, I will try to live up to the notion that we will be brief and get to the point, and I will turn it over to Professor Tansi, first of all, who will um, set us off. Thank you, Yuta, for your very kind presentation, and especially for the introduction that will make my task a lot easier. I would like to echo previous speakers in warmly thanking the organizers, Hélène in the first place, and her excellent team for inviting me to share ideas and views on a topic which I have always had at, at heart ever since I started to get to know a little bit. Uh, I didn't come into international water law as Utah did from environmental law, I just came as a rudimentary generalist and uh, I was simply asked by the legal advisor to the United Nations Italian mission to take care of an apparently extremely boring agenda item of the General Assembly um, session, the non-navigational uses of international water courses. And as the British say, I know what I like and I like what I know. Ever since I got to know a little bit about it, I, 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 I had a particular liking. On, on it. I will not delve so much into the actual case law, which has been masterfully um, and very succinctly, but to the point uh, introduced by Utah, but perhaps focus more on the applicable law, which is probably what adjudicative bodies have to look into when they administer justice. Um, now, each of the three pillars of international water law, two substantive and one um, procedural, uh, the equitable utilization and the no harm principles on the substantive side and cooperation on the procedural side may well be complied with or infringed upon individually. But this reflects one side of the coin, that is the retributive aspect, which is inevitably there in international water law as any branch of the law. But on the other side of the coin is the retributive side of international water law, which you find more evidently than in many other, if any other branch 
of international law as I personally see it. There are the three basic principles in question, the procedural and substantive principles, can be envisaged to operate as an inseparable cause as a series of inseparable cause in one will. Having strongly militated in favor of an integrated approach all along to international water law, I, for one, did not find extravagant Judge Donner's assertion in a separate opinion just mentioned by Utah in Costa Rica versus Nicaragua judgment, whereby she stated not to find it useful to draw distinctions between procedural and substantive obligations as the court has done. Likewise, I was not surprised that, nonetheless, on a few lines below her opinion, she could not help referring to, and I quote, to the procedural or substantive rules that give effect to the due diligence obligation of harm prevention, unquote. I suppose that while the procedure and substantive normative concepts in question are integrated with each other, at the same time, there remain two different aspects of the same normative setting, and they may be addressed either separately or jointly as the circumstances require. In my presentation, I purport to give a broad brush sketch of the main lines that will be elaborated upon in my, at least I promise to give a written contribution to the follow-up to the present gathering. Um, now, I shall try and demonstrate that the general procedural obligation of cooperation is meant to operate not only, certainly as, but not only as the catalyst for the optimal fulfillment of substantive principles, equitable utilization and harm prevention, but that it is truly embedded in the latter two principles. Sight not losing of the fact that the three-tier normative setting in question is in its turn meant to operate within the broader principle of sustainable development. I will argue the integration between the procedural and substantive rules of international water law following three main strands. First, I will argue that procedural obligations mainly give effect to the principle of cooperation in relation to both equitable utilization and no harm, underlying largely the participatory and distributive justice lens of international water law. Second, I will illustrate how procedural obligations also operate at the substantive level in relation to the due diligence obligations of harm prevention as addressed to riparian states, also individually, irrespective of the cooperation context the environmental impact assessment procedural obligation being just one example. Thirdly, I will emphasize that the same procedural obligations applicable to the operation of no harm specify and give effect also to the, to the equitable utilization principle. The co-reparian states involved acting either individually or jointly. If I may anticipate my conclusions, because it, usually when I'm about to express my conclusion, the time is up, and I usually comply with difficulty when, when I have to speak under time restrictions, now I understand that as far as you, you just said that we will have to be brief, given the last unfortunate no-show by Judge al Cassone, I've been asked to be a little bit long. I don't know how long I can be here, but I'll try and do my best bearing with your patience, of course. Now, if I may <laughs> anticipate my conclusions, uh, I shall try and draw from my threefold analysis basically two points. A, the procedural obligations envisaged by international water law are essential components of its basic substantive rules characterized in due diligence terms, both when such rules are performed by co reparian states jointly, because they cooperate, but also individually, when one of them or two of them do not want to cooperate. B, these substantialization of, of, of procedural obligations, and I use the reverse effective expression coined by my colleague Owen McIntyre, who speaks of the proceduralization of substantive obligations. Now, this substantialization of procedural obligations, as I see that, serves a twofold purpose. First, 
that of upholding the effectiveness of both sets of, obligation, of obligations, even where cooperation is not feasible. Second, that of preventive, preventing the substantive obligations in point from becoming subservient to cooperation. What do I mean by preventing substantive obligations from becoming subservient to cooperation? Their cooperation and agreement between cooperians would be taken as a license for the infringement of the substantive obligations, equitable utilization and no harm. In that way, cooperation would do away with the principle of the sustainable use of transboundary waters. Cooperation, both in the New York Convention of 1997 and in UNEC Convention of 1992, works, operates as a tool for the achievement of the substantive obligations. It's not an end in itself. Now, how did I come to this, I believe, brilliant conclusion? It's not my merits, but I contributed to it. The meeting of the parties to the um, UNEC convention in its, um, indeed, seventh meeting, 2015, uh, annexed in its final report the following statement in contained in its decision, blah, blah, blah. It says, and I quote, the transboundary cooperation is the key principle of the Convention as it supports the achievement of the Convention's object and purpose. It recognizes, however, that cooperation per se is not the only objective of the Convention and that the principles of reasonable and equitable use of, and of prevention, control and reduction of transboundary impact are no less important." Unquote. Why did the meeting of the party come to such a nice statement? The Implementation Committee, short of work, established in 2012, received just one potential case. An NGO submitted a piece of information that seemed alarming to the Implementation Committee concerning planned and ongoing works between Kazakhstan, Russia and China, the first two countries being a parties to the UNEC Convention, China not being such. Um, the information gathered from the NGO were absolutely alarming, but the Implementation Committee had to, be sat had to satisfy itself that the information in question were grounded. We looked into Google, but certainly we addressed Russia and Kazakhstan. The information we got from Russia was, no worry, full compliance with the Convention. We are warmly cooperating, not only with our friendly um, neighboring Kazakhstan, but also with a non-party neighboring China. Full cooperation, no problem with the Convention. This reply made me reminiscent of a piece of writing by Ellen Hay at the time when the New York Convention was just about to be adopted, said, isn't that perhaps a number of provisions in the Convention would provide a license for agreement to do away with equitable utilization and no harm. And there, Ellen Hay promoted all this reasoning that ended up in 2015. In uh, this statement by, authoritative statement by the meeting of the parties, which I hope could present a tool for consideration by international adjudicative bodies. I suppose I'm nearly finished when I'm about to start with my first point. Um, and I will cut it very short. My first point is that provision, procedural obligations of cooperations are embedded, are part and parcel of substantive principles of international law. Let me just mention Article 5, which spells out together with Article 6, the principle of equitable utilization. There is a part I want to draw your attention to, which is the last part of Article 5, Paragraph 2. It sets out the obligation for core parents and I quote, to participate in the use, development, and protection of an international water course. Such participation includes both the right to utilize the water course and the duty to cooperate in the protection and development therefore, thereof, unquote. Here you have the obligation of a substantive nature to engage in a equitable and reasonable utilization of the river, but at the same time, you have to do so hopefully, 
in a process of participation. But why that? Because equitable authorization is the expression of retributive justice. The order case statement of the equality of rights of, and the community of interest of the core parents. This goes hand in hand with the commentary made by the International Law Commission in the elaboration of the same, of much the same provision as it was eventually adopted in New York. And I quote, the principle of equitable participation flows from and is bound by with the rule of equitable decision set out in paragraph one, it recognizes that as concluded by technical experts in the field, cooperative action by water course states is necessary to produce the maximum benefits for each of them while helping to maintain an equitable allocation of uses and affording adequate protection to the water course states and the international water course itself." Unquote. Now, this passage shows the distributive justice rationale of the equitable utilization principle as a normative framework for balancing the equities of the core riparians in a manner which is compatible with the principle of sustainability and addressing at the same time both quantitative and qualitative issues. In Gapchikovo, the ICJ clearly enhanced the connection between cooperation and equitable utilization. He declared that having regard to the obligation of cooperation under the 1977 treaty, the resumption of joint action, quote, will also reflect an optimal way, in an optimal way, the concept of common utilization of shared water resources for the achievement of several objectives mentioned in the treaty, unquote. There again, the ILC, commenting Article 5, Paragraph 2, which has been, by the way, recalled after the passage just quoted by the International Court of Justice, remember, a few months after its adoption, we are 1997, the convention was adopted in May, and the decision was rendered sometime in September. So the convention was far, was way from entering into force, so the International Court of Justice endorse the uh, codificatory, evidentiary uh, nature of the equitable utilization principle as consolidated by the uh, New York Convention. There, the, the ICJ said, watercourse states have a right to the cooperation of other watercourse states with regard to such matters as flood control measures, pollution abatement programs, drought mitigation planning, erosion control, disease vector control, river regulation, safeguarding of hydraulic works, works, and environmental protection as appropriate under the circumstances." Unquote. Why such a long list? I mean, we are not talking about man-made works. We are talking about use of the river, which may be eroded, should be taken care of in the light of natural phenomena. So there is an even more integrated approach very much within the framework of cooperation. And that was equitable utilization. Let's turn to uh, harm prevention. Express reference to cooperation comes in Article 7 of the New York Convention only after harm has occurred. In connection with the legal consequences which have been caused by the diligent and equitable uses of water courses. In fact, its preventative terms come hand in hand with paragraph two. Paragraph two says that you have to address the consequences of harm being occurred despite all due diligence, also in compliance with Article 5 on equitable utilization. And there is a problem again of cooperation. You have to decide what is the threshold for negligible harm and what is beyond negligible, is significant. Can the origin state decide for what is significant for the lower riparian country? Or maybe Salman Salman also explained that harm may be caused to upper riparian countries by lower riparian countries. Who is entitled to say that? You want the two of them, but certainly the one who is potentially affected. 
And all this goes on and on with the fact that it can prove, and I will write that certainly there are tremendous elements of cooperation in the no harm principle. But what if this ideal world doesn't work? There is no cooperation. <laughs> that is the problem. Um, I believe that in a very little distributive justice approach, but rather retributive justice approach, and in Gapshikov, the court has applied also retributive justice. There was breach, reparation, no reparation, setting off. So there was quite a large amount of the retributive justice, hard and fast retributive justice. Let's see the domestic individual dimension of the provisional procedural obligations giving effect to harm prevention. In Paul Mills, paragraph two and two or four, the court says, due diligence and the duty of vigilance and prevention which it implies would not be considered to have been exercised if a party planning works liable to affect the regime of the river or the quality of its waters did not undertake an environmental impact assessment on the potential effects of such works." Unquote. Now, this passage addresses the domestic individual dimension of the procedural obligation in question. No cooperation involved. You have to do it whether you cooperate, you find nice cooperation by co reparence or not. In fact, the court went on to stress, and I quote, it is for each state to determine in its domestic legislation or in the authorization process for the project the specific content of the environmental impact assessment required in each case, unquote. As just mentioned by Utah, in Nicaragua versus Costa Rica, the ICJ found that this disputed road building would trigger the obligation to undertake an environmental impact assessment and an obligation that Costa Rica had failed to discharge. For purposes of my point, one is to note that the court, further to such finding, did not deem it necessary to consider Costa Rica's conduct in relation to its duty to notify or consult, finding it sufficient that, and I quote, it had not complied with its obligation under general international law to perform an environmental impact assessment prior to the construction of the road." Unquote. That is individually. Yuta, can you please tell me where, a warning, give me a warning of the last five to three min five minutes. Thank you. Now, as I see it, this dual mode of cooperation of procedural obligations in integration and independent from cooperation lies in the fact that the state would not be exempt from its due diligence obligation when met with the uncooperative attitude by its co reparents Cooperation represents a tool for the achievement of equitable utilization and no harm. When such a tool proves unavailable, cooperation, that does not mean that the riparian states individually become exempt from the procedural and substantive obligations in question. Understandable dissatisfaction has been voiced by Utah in her excellent uh, um, writings on the European Journal um, about the ambiguity of the court in Nicaragua versus Costa Rica due to the lack of express sanctioning of the breach of the obligation to undertake an environmental impact assessment as a breach of the due diligence obligation of harm prevention. The fact is that in this case, just like in the Palm Mills, the court found that there was no breach of the overall harm prevention rule because significant harm had not been caused. This can be in itself a reason for serious dissatisfaction. However, even better than nothing, it may be of little comfort that the court made a declaratory judgment on the breach of the procedural obligation in point expressly stating that it was meant as a form of satisfaction in itself. This applied in Nicaragua as much as in Palm Mills, and in their dissenting opinion, Judges Sima and Alcassoni stated, and I quote, this is not the proper way to pay due regard to the interrelation of procedure and substance, unquote. It may well be the case that there, the court missed the golden opportunity to explain such an interrelationship. That is to say that the court could have elaborated on the question as to whether and when, and I would stress when, non-compliance with procedural obligations can of itself amount to a breach 
of the due diligence obligation of harm prevention, and I submit also of equitable utilization. I suppose that the assessment in any given case as to whether due dilig the due diligence obligation of harm prevention or equitable utilization can be found to have been breached by Coriparian in the absence of damage having been caused is a matter for a case-specific evaluation under the factors and standards provided for by the applicable law consolidated by the two conventions in question. Such an evaluation would depend also on the kind and number of the procedural obligations that have not been complied with, and I stress including, but not exclusively, the, inter the environmental impact assessment. Now, the golden formula of due diligence obligations is all, all appropriate measures. This in this, both conventions on transboundary water courses, this is in most of, with some minor variations, of environmental, multilateral environmental agreements. But now, I would focus on all. As I see it, one should primarily assess whether all such measures have, have been adopted. But I mean, not all pertinent measures in abstract, in the abstract, but all those that are appropriate to the basing specific circumstances. And the basing specific circumstances may be hydrological, geological, sociological, anthropological, economic, and so on and so forth. Let me draw your attention to a galore of standards that you find in Article 3 of the UNEC Convention on Prevention, Control and Reduction, just to mention few, prior, prior li licensing of water, wastewater discharges by the competent national authorities, the application of the best available technologies, environmental impact assessment, yes, but also contingency planning, additional specific measures specifically geared to preventing the pollution of groundwaters, contingency planning, additional specific measures, setting emission limits, defining water quality obje objectives, and water quality objectives and criteria are being developed under a number of institutional settings that may be of use. They come handy also to adjudicative bodies. Now, I should end by saying, and I will anticipate what come out in writing, that actually, you have a tremendous in amount of integration between the procedural obligations pertaining to the no-harm rule and those that pertain to the equitable utilization. This will be a point that I will elaborate upon on uh, my written piece. And since I happily anticipated that I would be at a loss in my final uh, conclusions, I'm very happy that I've anticipated my conclusions at the outset of my speech. So I thank you very much for bearing with this. Thank you. Thanks very much. And now we'll hear um, a perspective about emerging principles, among other things, a slightly broader perspective. Um, thank you very much. I'd like to, I'd like to uh, thank the chair and thank the organizers. It's a great honor to address this audience. I want to uh, take a slightly different angle and to talk about the, um, the recent evolution of uh, procedural rules in international water law, where they do play a particularly important role. But then I want to go on and talk about two key challenges. And I characterize these challenges as the external integration of procedural rules of international water law. The need or the, the growing need to integrate these procedural rules with various other bodies of normativity, particularly international human rights law and international environmental law. And I focus on rights of participation that are emerging in these other fields of normativity. Um, although, of course, that need for integration might equally arise in uh, international investment law and other fields. And then I want to talk about the challenge of ecosystem protection and to put forward the argument that the, the, the established paradigm of, of uh, interstate procedural engagement that we see uh, uh, now established in international water law is not fit for purpose for meaningful implementation of an ecosystem's approach to the management of shared water resources. So, oh, I have a, sorry. 
I have a, a hastily put together PowerPoint presentation. Please don't worry too much about it. It's more for my uh, uh, assistance than for anyone else's, I think. Um, I want to, you know, if we start off and we think about the substantive obligations of international water law, the three key substantive obligations might be uh, equitable and reasonable utilisation, the prevention of significant harm, and then environmental and ecosystems protection obligations, whether they are separate, autonomous, standalone obligations or not. Now, these are all, um, in one way or another, quite indeterminate, normatively indeterminate, open textured norms. And so in order to be meaningful, it's very, very important that they're integrated with procedural obligations, coming under the, the umbrella of the duty to cooperate. And we know what these are, the, uh, the requirement for notification of planned measures, for routine exchange of information on the state of a basin. Uh, where differences arising from those processes lead to the need for consultation and negotiation in good faith, uh, possibly additionally the duty to warn, possibly leading to dispute settlement. And of course, for all of that, we have requirements for inst inst institutional machinery to make that work. But going beyond that, we see that there's a need for the integration of procedural obligations, both in terms of internal integration, and there are two aspects to that. The, the integration of substantive and procedural obligations, which uh, Attila and uh, uh, Professor Brunet have both addressed, and the integration of procedural obligations inter se, um, into a continuum. But also this external integration that I mentioned, the integration of procedural requirements with, other, with requirements under other bodies of normativity. Uh, and we see thus far, uh, these have centred on requirements for transboundary environmental impact assessment. And environmental impact assessment in this context is almost in a snowmer, where environmental impact assessment processes usually take account of social and even economic uh, impacts of projects. So, and I won't spend too long on, on, on substantive obligations. Uh, equitable and reasonable utilisation, enough has been said about this, based on consideration of relevant factors, if we take the, the UN Watercourses Convention formulation, which itself um, suggests that it's, it's highly procedural. Uh, reference to the principle of equitable participation in Article 5.2 of the Watercourses Convention, in association with the duty to cooperate and the procedural requirements under the duty to cooperate. Um, so what does it give us? A normative framework for achieving substantive objectives, really. Um, a, a strategic direction almost. These substantive objectives, optimal and reasonable, optimal and sustainable utilization, environmental and ecosystems, obje uh, ecosystems protection, and how? How do we achieve that? Well, only through structured procedural exchange. So in many ways, and I, I, I can uh, paraphrase Professor Stephen McCaffrey, who talked about equitable and reasonable utilization, we can view it more as a process than as a substantive rule. It's a due diligence obligation, and what's the nature of the due diligence? Well, stated very broadly, to consider the interests of co-riparians. And any consideration of the interests of co-riparians is, by definition, largely procedural. And we associate that with other concepts uh, consistently endorsed by the court, such as community of interests, which again you know, uh, suggests the consideration of a broad range of interests, which suggests uh, procedural engagement. Um, even the prevention of significant harm, again, is somewhat uh, an open textured norm. We have de minimis exceptions. It's a due diligence norm, uh, including at least sort of two forms of due diligence, substantive and procedural. At the substantive level, to introduce and enforce appropriate and often joint uh, regulatory measures. And at the procedural, to consider and mitigate risks to co-riparians or to ecosystems. Uh, and again, in association with the duty to cooperate, the procedural elements feature very, very uh, prominently. And then environmental and ecosystems obligations, particularly, and I'll move on to this, so I won't waste any time here, when we look at an ecosystems approach to uh, the management of, of water systems, we see that this requires, amongst other things, holistic management of the resource and of human activities, adaptive resilience management, uh, ecosystem services, consideration of ecosystem services uh, and possibly payment for ecosystem services or some other form of, of benefit sharing. The maintenance of environmental flows. If we think about what, the, what any of these requirements mean, we understand the procedural 
the, the intensity of procedural engagement required to achieve any of these complex uh, elements. And even in Article 21 of the UN Watercourses Convention, with the traditional environmental concern of pollution control, again, the, the, uh, the prominence given to joint measures uh, suggests uh, deep procedural engagement. So what are the key procedural obligations? Well, they're set out, the duty to cooperate, and under that, are referred to as the indispensable minima, going back to, minima, going back to um, uh, Lac Le Noue. Um, so notification, ongoing routine exchange of information, consultation and negotiation in good faith where differences arise, duty to warn, and ultimately dispute settlement. Uh, we need institutional mechanisms, and a lot's been said about this, uh, river basin organisations which have environmental, social, developmental uh, mandates and capacity. And the glue thus far holding all of this together is transboundary environmental impact assessment, which it, it facilitates effective procedural engagement by providing a... Uh, ideally providing a scientific or technical baseline that forms the basis of notification and then the basis for ongoing consultation, negotiation, where differences persist, etc. Um, have I kept up? Um, cooperation, I'm not going to go into detail to the, the procedural elements. We know pretty well what these are. We know that the legal basis for notification of planned measures uh, we have a very good idea from, from practice and from, from uh, studies of practice which states must be notified, which activities, the existence of RBOs impact on that, the, the notion of precaution informs uh, such decisions, ecosystems approach informs such decisions. Where we have EIA thresholds in applicable or even uh, 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 tangentially relevant uh, instruments, of course, helps to inform that. What form must notification take? Again, we understand that largely. Uh, good faith notification, uh, information regarding the nature of the activity, the risks of potential injury to other states and water courses. Uh, we know that it must be early, prompt, uh, it must be prior to permitting, allowing reasonable time for response, involving a duty to refrain, etc. On the other, the flip side of notification of planned measures, notification gets more prominence because disputes arise in relation to planned measures more commonly, but routine exchange of information. Uh, again, we, we have an idea of what that information exchange should involve, what kinds of information. Um, if we move on to consultation and negotiation, good faith consultation and negotiation where differences emerge. Uh, the, the, the stress placed on this in, in international law going back to Lac Le Noue. We know this is not consent, uh, no, it's not a requirement for consent, it's just good faith, uh, meaningful negotiation and engagement involving reasonable efforts to accommodate. Reasonable, and if we, if we link that back to the due diligence element of uh, equitable and reasonable utilisation. The, the duty to make uh, good faith efforts, reasonable efforts to accommodate. So, of course, no requirement to reach agreement and usually to be meaningful would have a duty to refrain. And we see them as a continuum. Notification uh, leading to consultation. If differences persist, leading to negotiation, etc. And ideally leading to dispute settlement of some form. A duty to warn, emerging rapidly in, in, in the international practice, etc. So, internal integration of procedural obligations of international water law. If we take pulp mills, despite uh, and notwithstanding some ambiguity stated and highlighted by Professor Brunet in the Sam Wine cases, if we look at, at uh, the, 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 the pulp mills case, it, made it, 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 it clarified. Uh, aspects of procedural and substantive obligations, talking about them being intrinsically linked, talked about a functional link to ensure equitable and sustainable management, but made it clear that they were not divisible and may be, a state may be required to answer for these obligations separately. They may be decoupled. So there are two obligations here. There is the, the due diligence or the, the procedural due diligence under substantive obligations. Uh, such as equitable and reasonable utilisation and no harm, but also there is a standalone autonomous obligation uh, to, to uh, comply with procedural requirements per se. Um, and then the integration of procedural rules in themselves. Pope Mills again talked about procedural obligations forming an integrated and indivisible whole. And this, in many ways, 
suggests the importance of, of environmental impact assessment. This uh, uh, compilation of key technical and scientific information according to internationally uh, accepted methodologies, which would inform the entire continuum of interstate engagement. And of course, RBOs play an essential role, which the court picked up in Pulp Mills, would not allow the, the Karoo to be circumvented. So the second aspect of internal uh, uh, integration of procedural obligations really focuses around transboundary EIA. So, um, uh, you know, we know that, that EIA is linked to the substantive obligations, is linked to notification and this continuum of procedural obligations. Uh, and it creates, uh, uh, you know, it's essential for effective notification. Uh, you know, the content, uh, the court didn't, was not drawn on the content of uh, transboundary EIA quite wisely, possibly, uh, except to say that there was an obligation twice to say that there was an obligation for continuous or ongoing uh, environmental impact assessment, which may prove to be very important in terms of facilitating adaptive management. Um, sorry, I had, was behind myself. External integration of procedural obligations, this is more problematical. You know, if we look, for example, at uh, the, 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 the need for integration between uh, the procedural obligations of international water law and international human rights law. In international human rights law, the right to participation is very, very prominent. If we look at the, the articulations of the, the emerging human right to water and sanitation, whatever its legal character, um, if we look, for example, at general comment number 15, it is peppered throughout with references to information accessibility, to access to decision-making processes, genuine public participation, uh, a participatory and transboundary process, etc., etc. full disclosure. If we look at established practice of regional human rights instruments and enforcement bodies, and uh, these are just reasonably random examples. If we look at, at the Ogoni case uh, before the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, you know, a right to a satisfactory environment under Article 24 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights includes procedural guarantees and specifically environmental and social impact assessment of projects. Uh, the, the, under the uh, Inter-American uh, Commission on Human Rights, its, it's um, uh, understanding of Article 11 of the 88 Additional uh, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Protocol. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights in the Sumo case, again, indigenous participatory rights regarding uh, natural resources. And of course, various decisions under the European Court of Human Rights, GERA, Zander, etc., all emphasize procedural engagement and the requirements of procedural engagement. Sorry, I, sorry I'm behind myself again, forgive me. Um, if we think of um, indigenous peoples, um, Article uh, or uh, ILO uh, Convention 169, again Article 6, 7, 15, and commentary of the uh, ILO Committee of Experts under Article 24 uh, on consultation and participation, a cornerstone of Convention 169. And participation is emerging in international water law practice. Under the practice under the UNEC Water Convention, its own uh, uh, practical sort of public engagement, uh, under the UNEC Protocol on Water and Health, uh, under the convention. And there are examples, we do see examples of where uh, public and stakeholder participation is inherent to processes of notification. A good example is Article 16 of the 2004 Zambezi Commission uh, Agreement. So what I would argue is the established paradigm of procedural engagement in international water law does not facilitate public stakeholder participation generally, and forgive me the generalizations. Um, and now this uh, uh, creates a, a problem because an agreement reached, for example, an agreement reached at the interstate level might be derailed at the national level by human rights challenges uh, to any, any arrangement reached at the interstate level. A second aspect of external integration uh, relates to international environmental law. So again, participation is becoming absolutely central in international environmental law. Going back to Principle 10, Rio Principle 10, um, Agenda 21, Article 18 on water, uh, the Bali Declaration from 2010 with national guidelines uh, uh, on, for national legislation. If we look at the, the emergence of Aarhus, which is being uh, copied in other parts of the world, uh, prospectively, uh, the ESPU Convention, the, the Kiev uh, SEA Protocol. If we look at the, the influence of pulp mills, uh, 
you know, the emphasis on transboundary EIA, as we know, the court did not need to stress this, as we know, public and our stakeholder participation is absolutely inherent to EIA. Um, and then more generally, if we think of this sort of global administrative or global environmental law argument, the standards emerging from a whole range of relevant processes, not strictly speaking legal, but um, from multilateral development banks and international financial institutions. Um, working at, at the PCM of EBRD, we've had a number of cases involving dam projects in recent years. Every one of them focused on public participation, the adequacy and quality of public consultation. Uh, also, the, the opening, if you like, the, 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 uh, the, I suppose, the cracks in the facade uh, in the jurisprudence of exit tribunals particularly around water, human right to water issues. Uh, in corporate CSR and uh, ESG codes in uh, the UN Global Compact, the OECD guidelines, again, we see that international water law is out of step with these uh, paradigms, which are likely to be highly relevant to certainly private sector actors involved in developing infrastructure in shared business. Um, and then finally, sorry, um, international water law and ecosystems protection obligations. So this idea of an ecosystems approach, despite the fact that it's a contested concept, um, it has a great deal of support. Common objectives are emerging around holistic management, around you know, uh, use of best available knowledge and, uh, on ecosystem dynamics, and reconciling human needs and ecosystem integrity. But core elements are becoming quite clear, including, and there are more than these, including, once again, broad stakeholder participation, but also adaptive management or adaptive resilience management or management for resilience. We even see agreements that are starting that could be characterized as being in some way adaptive or permitting adaptive management. The 96 uh, uh, Faraka Agreement, the 2002 uh, Inkomati Maputo Agreement, for example. So what's required here? Well, systemic or systematic, uh, a systematic learning or learning approach to adapting and improving natural resources management. So quite the opposite of what we currently do, and that is front-loading management decisions. So allowing those decisions to be revisited, ongoing management, monitoring, uh, uh, re-analysis, reassessment, and revisiting these arrangements. Um, requiring organizational learning, cross-scale linkages, institutional adaptive capacity, greater discretion for uh, cooperative bodies. I mean, how many of our RBOs actually provide for any discretion uh, uh, for those bodies? Um, continuing environmental assessment, etc. So, now that is at odds with the other function of international water law as we see it functioning, and that is the requirement of, stabili of stability. You know, international water law should, we understand, uh, uh, foster stability, particularly in the context of large-scale water-related investments in water-related infrastructure. So how do we reconcile these two things? It's going to require very, very sophisticated uh, uh, procedural uh, uh, mechanisms. Again, if we look at means of implementation at a more practical level, means of implementation of an ecosystems approach, environmental flows. Now, gauging and, and, and uh, calibrating environmental flows, we have support for this in Kish and Ganga. We have lots of technical guidance developing. It is developing as a, as a, a, a credible method, methodology, but it's unlikely to be something that we can do on a one-off, front-loaded process. Similarly, you know, consideration of ecosystem services. The ecosystem services considered significant are likely to change over time. Uh, and the, the impact of activities on those ecosystem services is likely to be better understood over time. So once again, and particularly if they involve payment for ecosystem services, etc., and forgoing development opportunities, ecosystem services is likely to uh, create the possibility of benefit sharing. And benefit sharing to um, you know, protect ecosystem function and ecosystem dynamics and to protect ecosystem services. Once again, if we look, for example, at the lessons learned, the most studied example of benefit sharing is the Columbia River uh, Basin example. And if we look at that, one key lesson comes out, and that is that we need really sophisticated legal and institutional frameworks for cooperation. And I'm not sure that we have those at the moment. Thank you. Well, let me begin by thanking both panelists for these um, excellent presentations that also, I think, very nicely complemented each other. Um, I did notice, though, one 
I'm trying to stir the pot here a little bit to the extent that is possible among generally agreeable um, colleagues. But Attila, you seem to suggest that um, procedural obligations play a particular role when cooperation may not be um, available or, or may not be functioning. And you seem to argue for integration and seem to say that procedural obligations really are what fills out, fleshes out cooperation. So I wonder whether I misunderstood something there or missed something, or do you actually have different uh, views on this, or um, you just chose to emphasize different aspects of it? And I don't know who wants to yes. maybe... After you, please. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm not saying that procedural obligations may play a role in enhancing a second chance of cooperation. But in the worst case scenario, when cooperation is not possible, since procedural obligations are embedded in the substantive obligations, such substantive obligations do not stop operating just because there is no cooperation, you see. And maybe these individual states that find themselves in a situation of impossibility of cooperation may be themselves or companies operating within their territory in the development of this planning before a non-interstate tribunal, an investment tribunal, or the state itself before a human rights tribunal may be held accountable for doing away with the substantive and procedural obligations that still operate irrespective of a cooperative context. I hope this is this yes, point is clear. Yes, this is entirely clear, Owen. Uh, I wonder if maybe the, the, the distinction isn't mostly semantic, um, in that uh, I've had this discussion many times with our mutual friend, uh, Dr. Christina Lebb, who, of course, has written the book on, on transboundary cooperation in this area. And I always struggle to understand what is cooperation? What would it look like? And I tend to, to, but my conclusion is it, it looks like effective procedural interstate engagement of some form or other. And so I, I see cooperation as largely, not entirely, not exclusively, but largely synonymous with procedural engagement. Now, maybe that's a very narrow view, but I tend to see it. I mean, because I, what, what form would that take? How would a lawyer recognize cooperation? And so the obligation to me seems rather empty without, with, you know, until we keep reading, if you like, and look at the procedure. Yeah, yeah. I, I see your point. Uh, probably our conception of the law very much is to do with our itinerary into the law. When I got into transboundary water courses, I published a book called Shared Natural Resources, Common Interest, Cooperation, All Well, Cooperation Embedded in the Substantive. But what if reality shows that there is no cooperation. Do we do away with, with substantive obligations altogether? I think under some kind of a systemic principle of effectiveness, we should try and still uphold some legal relevance of substantive water law principles, irrespective of, uh, of cooperation and the cooperative ideal fantastic thing. And as a lawyer, not only you are confronted with disputes, real disputes, but potential disputes. And uh, it's interesting, I mean, th this situation is very well envisaged by the drafters of the New York Convention. You have an obligation of notification, and the notified state has an obligation to reply, and, and may extend the period within which to, to study the data and information contained in the notification. It may uphold progress in the notifying state for six months, may uh, extend it for another six months, but it does not have a right of veto. Now, what happens if after 12 months there's no reply? Would you say that the whole construction, the whole normative building collapses and, and the notifying state, you haven't notified, I, I go ahead. I will stick and try to, um, to, to comply with equitable and reasonable utilization and no harm. Because maybe one day, some kind of change in government, there will be mutual agreement, special agreement, you go before the court and you will be held accountable. Or someone will find an apparently obsolete jurisdictional clause and you will be 
held accountable. You will be sued by some um, affected individuals before uh, a competent European, non-European human rights court or an, an investment trade. So I think that you probably have many answers that you want to give, but I think we have just about enough of a point of friction here for people to jump in and pick up on this issue or any other. So please, if you raise your hand, the microphone will come to you and um, please say who you are as well. Thank you. Uh, a short question to Attila, and thank you to the both uh, present, uh, presentators. When you were speaking about the relationship between procedural and substantive uh, procedures, you were referring to the no harm principle, and you were referring to the fact that had a significant harm happened or not. But in fact, when we speak about environmental protection, very often the harm is not, has not yet happened and it's forcible, potential, it might never happen, but we still have to prevent it. And so the question that I had is that, would the procedural rules not play a bigger role in this type of situations? The procedural rules. I mean, environmental impact assessment is clearly the, the, the main principle. Uh, if I have to look at the precedents, yes, the precedents are disappointing. There is no, there can be a declaratory judgment that that particular procedural obligation has not been complied with, but that is little comfort when it comes to not amounting to a breach of the due diligence obligation. What I tried to plead, and I will elaborate more, but maybe possibly now, I say all appropriate measures. Environmental, environmental impact assessment is the number one procedural obligation that an adjudicative body is to take into consideration. If there are no other indications of infringement of, um, besides environmental impact assessment is nowadays basically always compulsory when there is the slight suspicion that it may effect. And I would not consider it as a burden, but I consider it as a, as a, as a precautionary guarantee for the potential, potentially origin state. You do it to be on the safe side. So I would take it as, 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 as granted. But now the problem is, when the moment comes that in any particular circumstance, a court or an, uh, or, or an arbitration tribunal can say, you have infringed this procedural obligation, and that is sufficient for me to say that you have infringed due diligence obligations of harm prevention, or as Attila Tanzi says, even equitable and reasonable utilization. You have, and this is not the answer to this particular question, this is the answer of international water law as it has been couched by the drafters of the New York Convention and very much also the Helsinki Convention, you have very general principles, substantive principles. You have rather detailed but still, I mean, applicable on a case-by-case -case basis. The, 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 the mantra, the refrain that any international water law lawyer, yourself <laughs> included, Laurence, uh, is you have to look at a, a specific basing circumstance. In, in a circumstance which is hydrological, it is geological, it is social, it is economic, but it's also legal, it is also administrative, and you have to see. I mean, there is no clear-cut answer for every individual case, situations, but I can imagine very well a situation in which, and perhaps the court, in assessing in that particular case, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, or even the palm mills, should have gone a step forward, perhaps even saying there is, there is no breach of harm prevention due diligence. There is no breach of due diligence, because not just because there is no harm, because under the special circumstances of the case, despite having been a breach there of environmental impact assessment, at least it should have kept the door open. I would not 
close it. I do not subscribe to the ICJ, but I'm not in a position to give you a formula by which I can tell you in any particular case between Nepal and India or Chile and, and Bolivia that you have an infringement of the no harm rule just because you have infringed upon an ob a clear cut obligation of undertaking a procedural undertaking or complying with an obligation of uh, provisional um, procedural measures. Now, I can see that there are microphones already being um, readied for questions, but since I... Um, one, sentence. one sentence comes here in because I suppressed you from giving an earlier reply, so please no, jump I, in. I would just say very, very briefly that I think you highlight the key issue here, Attila, already, and that was that every basin is absolutely unique, in every aspect unique. And that's why procedural rules are elevated to a position in international water law. And chief among them are, are holding all of those procedural, formal procedural rules together is, is EIA. That, you know, we have to have an open textured procedural norm in order to begin to exercise any form of due diligence, to be able to consider the impacts on another state, the interests on another state, to have any, for, for any of this law to be in any way meaningful, we have to have that procedural protection in and of itself. And it must not be too closely tied to due diligence of a substantive obligation, because if we take the analogy from national law, we wouldn't suggest that because a developer failed to carry out uh, an EIA where required, but there's no harm, therefore it's okay. You know what I mean? We wouldn't, nobody would countenance that. You know, that would immediately make the entire decision-making process uh, wrong. So you can already see on our panel how it is that within the ICJ there are different opinions on this very important issue. Judge Mensah. Oh, sorry. So, yeah. uh, well, I, I am quite... Oh, tr sorry, Professor Travis, my apologies. Uh, I tend to agree with the idea Implicit, I think, in what Attila probably said, that there is a kind of continuum between the procedural and the substantive obligations. Still, seen from another viewpoint, namely that of a case of a judge in practice, we could say that it is much more difficult to give evidence of an infringement to a substantive rule than it is of an infringement to a procedural rule. So sometime when the judge has the impression that there has been wrongful act, a, a violation of a, of a substantive rule, but cannot really prove it, will be content in saying there was a violation of the procedural rule, and I declare that you violated it. Uh. If, 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 my, if I may react to this, I think I very much see the point. And, and this is particularly the case with international water law because not only you may have um, a breach of due diligence when you don't have harm, but you may not have an infringement, you may not have an engagement of state responsibility, you may not be confronted with an internationally wrongful act despite harm having been caused. So when you are dealing as a judge with such a category, such a body of international law, in which even the occurrence of harm is not in and it of itself a sufficient indication that there is an international wrongful act, the evaluation of the degree is an issue of calibration. Maybe the court would have said the sheer infringement of the environmental impact assessment obligation is not in itself an indication of breach of due diligence, not just because harm has not occurred. So I understand that in this particular uh, branch of international law, uh, the calibration of the omissions, uh, failures in the area of procedural obligations which are part and parcel, a continuum of the due diligence obligation, are difficult to calibrate, but it is difficult to give an absolute answer. Okay. Thank you very much. Marcelo Cohen from the Graduate Institute of Geneva. 
I would like to make just a brief comment uh, with regard to the case law that both panelists uh, referred to, the Argentina versus Uruguay case and the Nicaragua versus Costa Rica and Costa Rica versus Nicaragua cases. I think it is uh, worth stress, stressing a very important difference between these cases. Because in the Paul Mills case, you have a, an explicit conventional procedure, uh, very detailed, uh, which was at stake. Uh, whereas in the Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Nicaragua, Costa Rica cases, it was just uh, customary law that was uh, applied. And this is a point that uh, one should not uh, neglect in the analysis. And I would be uh, less pessimistic than Attila in the consequences of uh, what he mentioned as the declaratory effect of the judgments just by blaming the states uh, that uh, had not complied with the procedural rules. I think in the, in the Paul Mills case, uh, it was very important and, and it was uh, appreciated like this by Argentina, uh, that the judgment, the 2010 judgment, uh, rendered the statute uh, really applicable because if uh, the case could have not come, hmm, the case could have not come to the court, and the, the differences of views between the two parties to the treaty were very important as to the content of these procedural rules. To some extent, one could say that this very declaratory judgment concerning procedural rules saved the statute, the statute's procedure, the statute of the River Uruguay procedure. And the fact is that after the judgment, uh, it was clear for Uruguay that it had to comply with Article 7 to 12 of the Statute of the River Uruguay. So Uruguay had to change the interpretation of these procedural rules. That was very important. In the Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Nicaragua, Costa Rica cases, indeed both parties agreed on the content of the obligation to conduct an environmental impact assessment. Uh, Costa Rica just raised the issue of the emergency situation uh, due to the fact of the Nicaraguan invasion of Costa Rican territory, but both parties agreed. And I have to say that uh, uh, even if the court found that uh, Costa Rica did not comply with this obligation, with the construction of the road, Costa Rica was very happy with the outcome uh, because it is in the interest of both parties that this obligation to conduct an environmental impact assessment was reaffirmed by the court. The only problem I see with the, the contribution, the very important contribution of the court in the 2010 judgment, because it went beyond the conventional uh, law, uh, the, 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 the only problem I see uh, with the judgment in the Paul Mills case is that the court left for the domestic legislation the determination of the content of this environmental impact assessment. I would have preferred, but this is just a professoral attitude and not a council attitude, I would have preferred at least some minor elements, but some elements uh, given the framework in which domestic legis legislations um, must be enacted. Now, um, before giving the panelists the opportunity to offer any responses to this or any general observations, um, we might have time for one more question. Is that right? Quick one, if there's one more. Very short. Sure, please. Because we are, I think, the lunch hour is only one hour, so we have to try and keep to the schedule somewhat. But please, Sean. Sean Murphy from George Washington University. Uh, I'm just curious whether there's another continuum here that uh, the speakers might want to address, which is uh, situations where the government itself is engaged in the project versus situations at the other end where it's private actors engaged in the project. And then somewhere as well on this continuum, a large number of projects and yet maybe a few discrete projects. It seems to me that you know, the single project by the government 
provides the strongest opportunity to apply some of these rules. The numerous projects by non-state actors may be the weakest situation to apply these rules, and I just invite any thoughts about that. So maybe we'll start with you, Owen, and respond to this or any of the other and if I start, I mean, I was trying to highlight that one of the problems with, with the very state-centered process of, of procedural engagement is that it maybe doesn't have regard to certain actors, where those actors are uh, seeking to rely on uh, human rights norms, where they're seeking to rely on environmental norms that perhaps they can use. Uh, but it may arise in a whole range of other situations, and it's really a question of, of the, the disconnection, if you like, between the state-centered rules on procedural engagement and a series of other uh, 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 levels of engagement, if you like. It could easily arise in the context of international investment law, where a private actor is the investor in a hydropower dam. And over time, we find out that it's, it's having certain ecological impacts that we have to change its mode of operation, but that's going to have impacts on the, the viability of the project, on the profitability of the project. So there are a whole range of, of difficulties with the lack of formal engagement. Now, within the domestic system, ideally, there ought to be. Uh, but it's, it's the disconnection. We've all seen this in every area, the disconnection between domestic processes and, and uh, interstate processes. Uh, when you talk about multiple projects, ideally, if there is an effective uh, development control system within domestic law, uh, that should catch that. You know, so cumulative impacts, the, 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 it really should be largely irrelevant, whether it's private actors or a state agency, they should still be subject to development control, subject to environmental impact assessment, et cetera. Whether that works or not is another, is another issue. And just to address two issues, I take your point uh, about pulp mills, and pulp mills was based on a convention, on a, a, a bilateral agreement. Although many of the court statements seem to go beyond that in terms of talking about EIA being necessary for meaningful notification. So the implications of these statements spill out beyond the convention uh, very, very much. Um, there was another, your, your, your very final point. Um, I'm trying to remember, I had something to say on your, on your very final point. Maybe that is a lunch conversation. The, the content of... Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, and it was just very briefly that, you know, nowadays there's so much uh, 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 interstate learning and technical assistance, and, uh, you know, uh, that I can't think, I've never come across or heard of a process of environmental impact assessment that didn't have broadly similar rules on public consultation, on, you know, the assessment of, of uh, alternatives, on the, the no development option, etc. that there is a, you know, a growing convergence around the international methodology. So I wouldn't have been so terribly concerned that the court didn't open up a whole other range of problems for itself by talking about the content, but relying on domestic systems. All right, I will, in the interest of time, is this here sets the... Would you like to entertain this appeal to? Yes, there we go. 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Uh, and no the, reply. <laughs> the, point is, the, the point is not environmental impact assessment in general in domestic legislation, but environmental impact assessment in cases of potential transboundary harm. This is the point. Because, yes, uh, well, 30 seconds. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> and Achille, famous last words go to you. The, the short re reaction. I, I'm very pleased with your remarks, which reminds me also of the um, the, uh, the doublement fonctionnel of, of a judge. A judge is sitting there to settle a given particular dispute and is concerned on how to best settle the case and is less concerned with what the, the scholars will say and, and what is actually its whatever we say, its role in the promotion, development, uh, or regression of the legal process. And I understand that in palm mills they did well, in the, in the end uh, they, they, they struck a deal three months after. And as um, Judge Tonka just said, maybe we can find that much of the, um, of the Gabchikov Nagimara decision remained dead letter but it helped diffusing the tension and all that. There is a pragmatic political 
adjudicative role, and then there is a part, the contribution. So, but I think that it has enhanced uh, the legal strength of procedural obligations, but the linkage between procedural and substantive obligations from an academic standpoint left to be desired, but perhaps in that particular instance that was not the role of the, the main priority for the judges sitting in The Hague. Now, maybe I can use the moment to reverse the brilliant strategy of Professor Tanzi earlier to start with this conclusion, because I omitted to say something when I opened the panel, which was, in addition, obviously, to thanking our wonderful panelists, I also wanted to thank uh, Hélène ruiz fabri for making this possible, and in particular, Tamar and Marco for bringing such great people together on panels to have this discussion and for organizing a wonderful conference. And with that, thanks very much. It's lunchtime. <laughs>